Hello everyone, this is Professor Nji Kun from Unimas. In this video, I'm going to give you a lecture on pre-stressed concrete technology, which is the lecture number one, part one. First of all, let's look at uh, the concept of pre-stressing. Eh? So, concrete, we know that it's very strong in compression, but very weak in tension. So that's why we provide reinforcement at the tension zone of a concrete structure. Eh? So other than that, we use pre-stressing as an additional step to deliberately, deliberately create permanent stresses or create permanent internal stresses in the structure or system to improve its performance. So other than adding reinforcement, we add in pre-stressing force and create some permanent internal stresses uh, in the structure to improve its performance. So how do we achieve uh, pre-stressing to improve its uh, performance? So it's by imposition of a concentric or eccentric force in the longitudinal direction of the structural element. So let us illustrate how we are going to impose the concentric or eccentric force eh, in the in longitudinal direction of the structural element. So take an example of uh, blocks forming an arch like this. So if we use a steel rod and then we tighten the ends of the steel rod, then these steel rods will impose a compressive force eh? okay, on the arch. So this compressive force is very near to the centroid of the cross section. And this force here is eccentric to the centroid of the centroidal axis of the cross section. So this is considered as a concentric force at this section here and is considered as an eccentric force at this section C here. So when we have a concentric force at section B and A, then the stress caused by the concentric force is quite uniform. Huh? Okay, it's almost a constant distribution of internal stresses. So these stresses are the stresses in the concrete. So by, by using this method, we are deliberately creating some internal stresses to improve the performance of the structural element. Furthermore, if you look at cross section C here, where the pre force here is eccentric. So when it is eccentric and is eccentric to the bottom of the centroid, then the bottom part of the cross section will be subjected to higher compressive stress as illustrated here. So we have a very high compressive stress at the bottom because of the eccentric force here, where the eccentricity is towards the bottom so the compressive stress is higher here and then the compressive stress is zero or almost zero on top. Eh? This, the stress here sometimes it can be tension, sometimes it can be zero, sometimes it can be compression depending on the magnitude of this pre-stressing force and also the magnitude of the eccentricity. So another way of achieving higher performance of the structures is an example in a wooden barrel make of wooden stuffs tie up with metal bands. Eh? So when we put the metal bands and we try to knock these metal bands and try to uh, exert some tensile stress in the metal band, then the reaction is compression on the wooden staffs like this. Okay, so this is the reaction from the action of 
the steel metal bands eh, that is in tension so that when there is a liquid inside the wooden barrel that exerts a radial pressure on the structure here then this pre-stressing force the reaction created by the pre-stressing force will help to hold all the wooden stuffs together where F is the pre-stressing force okay so this is these are two examples on how we can use pre-stressing to improve the performance of the structures so let us compare the uh, beams that is uh, non pre stress and another beam which is pre stress so for a non pre stress beam or in short is a normal reinforced concrete beam so the steel is not in tension when there is no external loads okay so in this case because there is no pre-stressing force so the steel does not exert any internal stresses in the concrete so that's why the strain is zero stresses are also zero so moment is also zero in this case when there is no external loads as opposed to non pre stress uh, beam, a pre stress beam has a pre stressing steel that is already being tensioned in the first place before the external load is imposed on the beam. So, this pre stressing force that is eccentric will create high compressive stress when there is no load and then it may exert small compression or zero stress or tension on the top of the beam so this is the strain so you see that the bottom of the beam is in compression and the top here is in tension so the corresponding stresses is that we have compression at the bottom and tension on top Okay, so this is before any imposed load is put on the beam. So in this case, there's already uh, no moment, or, although there is no moment in the beam, but there is already pre-stressing force in the beam. Okay, and then when uh, we have imposed load on the non-pre-stressed beam before cracking happens okay then you see that the strain and the stress distribution is still quite small in this case creating a very small bending moment but if you look at the case of a pre-stressed beam just before cracking happens in the concrete the concrete has already been experiencing very high compressive stress on top and then probably a small tension at the bottom of the beam okay as well as for the stresses right so in this case with this uh, high stress distribution we have uh, quite a large moment uh, before the steel uh, before the concrete cracks so in this case as compared to the non pre stress beam with a very small moment the cracking moment in the pre-stress beam is much higher so meaning that the pre-stress beam has the ability to resist more load before the concrete cracks and then when the beam has reached ultimate limit state okay so ultimate limit state normally the maximum deformation in the concrete is 0.003 in compression and then we have the stress distribution in the concrete like this and then the moment from this stress distribution here is this uh, force multiplied by the moment arm yeah? okay 
So in the pre-stress case also, we have a similar strain distribution and similar stress distribution, but we have a very high stress in the pre-stressing steel as compared to the non-pre-stress steel. So meaning that this force is much higher than this force here. So meaning that in the pre-stress case, the beam can resist a higher moment at ultimate limit state. So next, let's look at the historical development of pre-stressing. So pre-stressing actually started in 1872 with a patent by P.H. Johnson in the United States. So this Patented pre-stressing system is a tie rod to construct beam or arches from individual blocks eh? as shown in the illustration here. So these are individual blocks and a tie rod is used to tie all these individual blocks into an arch or a beam that can carry loads. Huh? Okay. So next in 1888, C. W. Dorring of from uh, Germany obtained a pattern for pre-stressing slabs with metal wires. So these early attempts at pre-stressing were not really successful due to loss of the pre-stress with time. So you know that the steel is already initially uh, tensioned, eh? okay? but this tension like a rubber band, they will lose tension with time. So because of the lack of uh, development of uh, high strength materials at that time, so the stresses loss, loses its uh, stress with time and they are not very effective. So then in the 1900s, J. Lund from Norway and G. R. Steiner from US, they tried to solve this problem of uh, loss of pre-stress, but they were also not very successful because of the unavailability of high strength steel to overcome pre-stress losses. And then R.E. Dew in Nebraska recognized the effect of the shrinkage and creep of concrete on the loss of pre-stress. He subsequently developed the idea that successive post-tensioning of unbordered roads would compensate for the time-dependent loss of stress in the roads due to the decrease in the length of the member because of creep and shrinkage. So creep in concrete is the deformation uh, when it's under permanent stress. So, we, as we know, in pre-stressing, we are creating some internal stresses in the concrete. Uh. So, the concrete were already uh, being stressed before loading is put on the structure. So, when the concrete is under permanent stress, then creep will happen. So when crit happens, then the steel will lose some of its stress. Eh? So meaning that the, there's loss of stress eh, in the roads due to the decrease in the length of the member. And shrinkage is due to drying of concrete. So when water is evaporating from the concrete, the concrete will shrink in volume. So when the concrete shrinks in volume also, the steel will shorten as well. So when the steel shot is shortened, then the stress in the steel will be decreasing. So because of these two phenomena, they contribute to the time-dependent loss of stress in the pre-stressing steel. So he, this RE deal here, he found out this phenomenon of creep and shrinkage on the effect of loss of stress eh, in the pre-stressing steel. And then in 1920s, 
W.H. Hayward from the U.S. developed the principle of circular pre-stressing. So we have already seen the effect of circular pre-stressing in this example here, okay, where the steel or metal bands is is uh, circulating the structures, uh, and then this pre-stressing force is considered a circular pre-stressing force to contain the radial pressure in the structures by exerting compressive stress on the wooden staffs uh, in the circumference uh, direction. And then in uh, 1928, Eugene Fresnet from France proposed the use of high strength and high ductility steels to overcome pre stress losses. So by this time, there is already a technology to develop a high strength and high ductility, high ductility steels. Eh? So therefore, this type of materials is good to overcome pre stress losses. And then Fresinet has become a brain of uh, pre-stressing system. Eh? And then in the 1930s, P. W. Abelis from uh, England introduced the concept of partial pre-stressing. So partial pre-stressing meaning that we allow cracking in uh, pre-stress concrete, eh? or we just uh, add some a little bit of a pre-stressing force into a reinforced concrete uh, structures. So in this case, we improve a little bit of performance of reinforced concrete, but not going into full pre-stress concrete structures. Eh? And then in the 1940s, G. McNeil from Belgium and Y. Guillaume from France they extensively develop and use the concept of pre-stressing for the design and construction of the various bridges. So, these two persons, they have developed a very good design concept uh, for pre-stressing. So, the diagram that we use in design is today is still using his name as the method of analysis. Uh, it's called the McNeil diagram. So McNeil diagram is a very good uh, method of uh, analysis uh, to design the pre-stress concrete structures. And then also during 1940s, F. Leonhardt from uh, Germany, V. Mikhailov from Russia, and T. Y. Lin from the US, they also contributed a great deal to the art and science of the design of pre-stress concrete. So this T. Y. Lin is a very famous uh, person in the U.S. Uh, where he has a company called T. Y. Lin Associates, which has uh, branches all over the world. And they are mainly dealing with the design of pre-stress concrete structures. And then in the 1952, FIP was formed, and this is the Federation of uh, International for Pre-Stressing. So this is in French. Eh? Okay, FIP is the short form for Federation of Internal uh, International Pre-Stressing in French, right? Okay, so now we want to look at uh, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, pre-stressing. Yeah? So first, let us look at the advantages. So f the first advantage is that it's lighter and more economical for long span structures. Because we are deliberately creating internal stresses in the structures, and then we are creating some uh, negative deflection uh, in the first place. So in this case, we can use a lighter and more economical 
section uh, for long span structures, meaning that we can use a smaller cross section for the structure. And then secondly, we can control cracking because we can first deliberately creating some uh, compressive stress in the concrete in the zone where the concrete may experience tension when uh, it is imposed with loads. So the uh, compression that we initially uh, created using pre-stressing will be uh, neutralized by the tension uh, due to the imposed load. Eh? So therefore we can delay the cracking in the structures. So we can control cracking by uh, first introduce some internal compressive stresses in the concrete in the zone where it may experience tension when there is imposed load. And then thirdly, we may have less problem of deflections because we have already created some uh, negative deflection in the first place uh, before the external load is being placed. So we know that when the imposed load is put on the structures, the deflection is downward. Uh. So if we have already created some upward deflection initially, using pre-stressing, then we may compensate the downward deflection later caused by the impulse load. So in this manner, we can control the deflection. So the fourth advantage that I've listed here is that we can reduce the web thickness because part of the vertical force is resisted by the vertical component of pre-stressing. If we have vertical component of uh, pre-stressing, we may use that vertical component to resist the vertical shear force due to the self-weight or the impulse loading. Okay, And then the fifth uh, advantage that I'm given here is that the quality of concrete is tested during the pre-stressing operations. So remember that we deliberately create some uh, internal stresses uh, which are compressive stresses into the concrete structures. So therefore we are uh, indirectly testing the quality of the concrete. If the concrete quality is uh, not good then the concrete may fail eh, under these uh, internal stresses created by the pre-stressing force. So in other words, we are trying to test the concrete eh, when we apply pre-stressing force on the concrete. And then the last one that I put here is uh, pre-stressing mostly they are precast sections so precast sections are produced in the factory. So we may impose a better quality control in the factory when we produce the precast sections. And then the disadvantages of using pre-stressing is that it involves high cost. High cost because of the, the high strength and high ductility steel. Okay, so these materials are very expensive. Okay, they are a few times more expensive than the normal reinforcing steel. Okay, and in pre-stressing also, we need machineries like uh, hydraulic jacks. Uh, okay, for the pre-stressing operations. So the hydraulic jacks also in, uh, involve cost as well. So because of the machinery and the materials which are expensive, so they are mostly more expensive than normal reinforced concrete uh, structures. And then secondly, 
they involve a high technology although the technology is not so new but the uh, because of the very low usage in uh, this region eh? so that's why we still consider them as a high technology in this region because it involves uh, specialized uh, machineries okay and then we need uh, high skilled workers eh, to operate all these machineries and also the installation of the pre-stressing steel so therefore uh, the labor we need high skilled labors eh, in this case not uh, uh, pre-stressing cannot be carried out by just general labors eh? okay we need a uh, high skill levels in this case and then the third disadvantage of using pre-stressing is that there is a safety control that is in concern because pre-stressing involves uh, tensioning a very high strength steel eh? so these steel are subjected to very high stresses and therefore very high force okay so that means the en energy stored in the pre-stressing steel is very high so once we have failure of the pre-stressing steel eh, there's a there's a very high energy release from the pre-stressing steel itself so there's therefore it's a very dangerous okay the broken pieces of the steel eh, may fly off and the effect is just like a bullet shooting from uh, from a gun eh? okay so if you, have piece, if you have people behind all these uh, broken pieces of the uh, steel eh? then the the life of the person may be in danger once they they are shot with uh, these broken pieces of the pre-stressing steel eh? okay and then uh, as i mentioned just now most most of the pre-stressing structures are precast sections so for precast section normally it involves uh, quite complicated molds eh? because we need to leave some spaces for the pre-stressing steel and normally we don't use just normal rectangular sections eh? normally we use the t sections or y sections okay or double t sections okay so normally the uh, precast section they involve complicated molds so complicated molds also they are very expensive so also contributing to high costs all right so next we look at the materials uh, that we use in uh, pre-stressed concrete so for concrete we need a higher strength concrete okay we cannot use a normal strength concrete eh? so higher strength concrete that means we have a low water to cement ratio and we need it to be better compacted okay so in this case quality control is of concern eh? okay so in uh, pre-stressing normally the uh, concrete strength that we are looking at is uh, grade 30 okay grade 30 is for is the minimum grade of concrete that we can use in uh, pre-stressed concrete eh? especially in uh, pre-tensioning operation so we'll look at uh, pre-stressing operation later eh? okay we'll look at what is pre-tensioning operation and uh, what is post-tensioning operations eh? so for pre-tensioning operation the minimum concrete grade is 30 megapascal and then for post tensioning operation the minimum concrete grade is 40 megapascal okay so you have to remember these two uh, minimum grades of concrete eh, for different pre-stressing operations right so and then for pre-stressing steel so pre-stressing steel come in uh, different forms eh? so the first type is uh, pre-stressing bars pre-stressing bars uh, looks like this okay where you have uh, something which may look like uh, normal reinforcing bars 
but they are threaded. Okay, so they are threaded so that we can use a nut to tighten uh, the to tighten the anchor blocks so that it can uh, induce uh, tension in the bars. Uh. Okay, so this is pre-stressing bars, right? And then we have wires. Okay, so these are the typical diameters of wires for bars. These are the typical diameters. So the diameters are the diameters for bars. Uh, they are mostly similar to uh, non-pre-stressing steel or normal reinforcing bars. Okay, and then for wires, wires we have four, four point five, five, six point seven millimeters of diameters. So wires, they comes in rows like this. Okay, so they look like a normal wires, but for pre-stressing they are made of a very high strength and high ductility steel. Eh? Okay not like normal wires huh? okay this must be high strength and high ductility steel wires for pre-stressing purposes right and then we have uh, strains okay strains are the most commonly used pre-stressing steel huh? okay so strains are made of a group of wires spun in helical form around a longitudinal axis and the nominal sizes are 9.5, 12.9, and 15.7 mm. Okay, so notice that for bars and wires, there we specify the size using the diameters because they are solid cross sections. Okay, so if you look at bars, okay. If you look at the cross section of bars, it's a solid section. Wires also is a solid section. If you cut across a wire, the cross section is also solid like a, a bar. Okay. But for strains, okay, for strains we don't use diameters. We use nominal sizes because strains you see that when you look at the cross section there are gaps in between the wires so it's not a solid cross section eh? therefore we cannot use the diameter to calculate the area of the cross section so that's why we call it the nominal size okay we have to look at the specification okay of the or the catalog of the pre-stressing uh, strains uh, to look at how much is the cross section cross sectional area of the pre-stressing steel right so this is a typical seven wire strains so meaning that we use seven wires and then spun then in uh, helical form to form uh, pre-stressing strains like this so also if you look at the cross section also they are not solid cross section eh? that's why we use a nominal size to indicate the size of strains eh? okay so strains these are the most common types of strains okay just uh, strains with uh, wires spun in the helical form eh? okay so this type of strains is a uh, more modern type Okay, where you have uh, smaller gaps in between the wires. If you use just normal round wires, okay, you see that uh, for the cross section here, you have a lot of gaps. Huh? Okay, but for this type of uh, pre stressing steel, you see that there is very small gaps okay, in between the wires. So the wires are not typical round wires, huh? they are of uh, trapezoidal cross sections all right so that's all for lecture one part one of pre-stressed concrete technology okay so see you in the next video